I think we've we've gone far too far the wrong way, and we need to get back to much more natural methods. Certainly, that's my go-to um, oil, and it, I think it's going to be the best for your health. The number one factor that correlated with the best gut health was not whether they were vegan, it wasn't whether they were gluten-free, vegetarian, pescatarian, whatever. It was. Tim, what's one area of your diet that's changed since doing the research for the new book? Well, there are many. Um, I guess I probably have um, changed my breakfast uh, quite a lot is the first thing I've noticed. So I've done away with the muesli granola uh, breakfast with the, the low fat milk and um, the orange juice. And I've now gone for a high fat yogurt, nuts and seeds and lots of black coffee. Uh, it's definitely, uh, I think the most obvious change to my diet. Um, I have less fish as well. Um, than I, than I used to, um, and lots of little things really that within categories I'm choosing different foods, uh, and avoiding things that I, that I thought were healthy and, and no, no, and, and not as healthy. And I've changed in a bit also the, not just, what I eat, that uh, how I eat, uh, timing of my meals and things like this. So, you know, it, it's part of a sort of ongoing experiment, I'd say, rather than I found the definitive uh, best way to eat. But uh, it, it's, uh, it's definitely evolved a lot in the six years since I started writing. Well, let's take some time and really pick this apart because I'm curious about the nuances when it comes to your diet. And I think a good jumping off point to get into some of the nuances is to talk about a typical day of eating for you. So let's start with breakfast. You, you talked about changing up your breakfast. So let's talk about when you eat and what you eat in a typical day. Well, there isn't really a typical day now because that's the other. Um, I do often tend to mix things up. And so this week, for example, I've um, start realized that I, I'm pretty much not having breakfast. Um, so s most of the week I've, I've actually not had breakfast and I've had my lunch between 12 and one o'clock. So, or you could say my breakfast has been uh, a couple of black coffees, um, depending on your definition of breakfast. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that's really changed quite a lot. I used to be fairly regular and saying, well, I have to have something to eat before I go to work or I do some exercise or I get on my bike or do things. So now, uh, definitely made that, that shift. And I think that's, that's one of the interesting things, which is a pity because I actually quite enjoy breakfast as a, as a, as a meal. Um, and so it's a trade off between, um, uh, pleasure and, um, filling time and, and uh, feeling, feeling more energized. So I, it's, it's still a work in progress as I'm trying to work out what actually suits me best and, and whether, you know, I do things differently at the weekends or in weekdays and depends whether I'm working at home or I'm um, cycling to uh, the university. So, um, but when I do have breakfast, it, it you know, it, it, it's, um, it's generally, I try and have it later. So, um, I would have it around 10 or 11 o'clock so that I've given my chance to have a, a longer overnight fast. And, uh, it's generally a high fat, um, and low carb breakfast that's quite different to my old breakfast six years ago, um, that I was having. And I think, um, I tend to avoid too much bread as well. But, uh, Whereas the past bread used to sort of dominate as well as my muesli granola, I would, you know, have, um, some toast. Um, and that's, uh, I do that rarely now. And if I do, I'm picking specific types of bread as well. So I'm, I'm fussier about when I have, if I have bread. So my lunch, uh, you know, I would often just have a sandwich. Um, and I would pick 
a healthy looking bread that will look like granary bread with seeds on it or a malted loaf. Um, and I'm much more suspicious of those kind of breads now that look healthy, but actually, uh, underneath it and, and, and not because they, um, I've realized that in healthy looking breads, there's a, a tenfold variety in the amount of fiber that they actually contain when you, when you drill down into the, behind the label and they all have all kinds of deceptive labeling on them, trying to get you to buy them, you know, names like wheat germ and whole grains and things that are actually pretty meaningless, but uh, all make you try and make you believe that, that that is the wholesome thing to eat. But in the end of the day, if there is a label, and a lot of them don't have to have labels on bread, particularly if it's made from frozen in the shop, um, it's, I've learned to look at the, the fiber carb ratio of breads. And, uh, in the book, I actually went to the detail of logging them all out and, and realizing that they do vary a lot. You know, between a sort of optimum bread that has a ratio around um, four carbs to one of fiber, to the what you commonly see is ones of around twenty to one, um, where it can look like a brown, healthy bread, but it actually has about the same ratio as a bagel or a croissant. So, um, yeah, I'm. Perhaps much, much more cynical, really, about food, I think, now. And that's, um, it means, you know, I'm a bit fussier. And the, the way to get your own bread is obviously to make your own, is, is, is undoubtedly the, the way you know exactly what goes into it is, uh, to make it yourself at home. And I, I've started doing that since writing the book. So I make my own sourdough and I tend to have it with, um, a decent proportion of rye, which of all the grains tends to be the one that um, has the greatest amount of fiber, is best for my gut health, and gives me the, the lowest sugar peaks. But uh, I always add in as much, many different grains to give me diversity as possible. So yeah, I've become a bit of a bread snob, if you like. Um, and when I do go to Paris or something for a, a couple of days, um, I do I do have this difficulty you know picking up that croissant uh with the same gusto that i did uh six years ago but of course, you've got to have eat them occasionally but you know make sure you're not going to have them every day because they'd they would definitely not be good for you let's talk more about that time restricted eating piece you mentioned over the last period of time this is something you've adopted eating later in the morning or eating around lunchtime what is science showing us when it comes to eating this way that's made you make this switch well, the, the, the data has only come in the last couple of years, really, that uh, shows us that we've known for a while that in, a, in animals, if you change the timing windows, you can alter their metabolism and you can alter what appears to be their health. So there have now been a number of human studies in relatively small numbers of people, but well controlled to show that changing that timing window will, so that you actually... Uh, eating in a smaller time and fasting for a longer time, but keeping roughly the same amount of food. Eating with a fa longer fasting window reduces your sugar peaks. Uh, you pushing out less insulin. You're getting lower fat peaks. You're getting rid of your fat quicker. You're lowering your blood pressure, and you're improving your, your metabolic health. And some of the studies, not all of them, show that you can get some modest weight reduction as well. And so if you take all of those small studies together, you're generally showing a, a healthy pattern for most people that increases as, as you increase the fasting time. And the data is quite convincing that if it suits you to do it, then it's a pretty easy way to improve your metabolic health if it does fit in with your lifestyle. Now, what those small studies haven't shown is whether you can actually sustain that long term. And whether, you know, it, because if it's not sustainable, there's no point doing it just for a few weeks. It's not going to be a really effective instant weight loss program. Um, 
And most, most of the ones that have produced weight loss have combined it with calorie restriction, which is not something I'm interested in personally. I think it's, um, you know, it's always going to end with a rebound. So, um, that's what I'm experimenting with and I'm, I'm working out what, what suits me best. But so far, modest, um, restriction of, the, of this time seems to work pretty well for me. So eating in this uh, 10 hour window, I don't find particularly difficult and, uh, it seems I have more energy after it. So it's looking like this could be my long term, uh, way to go. And interestingly, we've just initiated this mass study called the big if study, which we're launching this week in the UK to look at about half a million people, uh, on, on the Zoe health study app to try and get them all to do this sort of mass community program of all changing their eating windows. And interesting, some people were going to eat early and some people are going to eat late. And I think that's the other interesting question um, because the, the data so far show that if you can eat early and, and fast late, you tend to have some advantage. But most of those studies have been done in younger people not older people. So we don't know whether that applies to women or, or, or people aged over 50 or people going through the menopause, etc. And so that's really what we're trying to find out. And I think the practicality, sorting out how you do this for your life long term is much more important than some minor metabolic gain that would be impossible to sustain. So if you told me I couldn't eat after 4 p.m., I would not be able to adhere to that diet. Um, it wouldn't fit in with my social life. It would cut into my enjoyment of food, all kinds of things. So I would just say, well, stuff that, you know, um, uh, I'm not doing it. So I think this is what I'm interested in now is moving from the theoretical science that's been done in highly controlled studies of 25, 30 people to seeing what happens when you take it into these mass community studies in the population. And that's, that's really going to be uh, some real fun to see what that shows. That will be fascinating. And you quickly touched on the calorie restriction piece, and this is something I wanted to get into with you. So for time restricted eating, we're generally having the same or around the same amount of calories within that, that tighter window. Let's talk about expanding that window, not having a window specifically, but lessening the calories in talking about what research is showing, you mentioned quickly there the fact that it's not sustainable, people are going to bounce back. But there are people talking about the longevity benefits of cutting down on calories. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so obviously, you know, we've had a couple of decades now of people uh, starting with, you know, rodent studies and, and then some short term human studies about how if you restrict calories, you potentially you know, improve your metabolism and potentially longevity. Now, there's no doubt that um, that works in, in animals, particularly small animals, insects, etc., to quite an extent. No one's proven that it increases longevity in humans. Um, the short-term trials do show that you can improve metabolic health with, like, an intermittent fasting that includes calorie restriction, which is what the old term of intermittent fasting used to be. You know, you just um, don't eat anything for 24 hours and then, you know, perhaps a couple of times a week and then you eat normally the rest of the time. But when you compare, um, say, a, a several weeks study where one group is doing calorie-restricted intermittent fasting and the other one is doing just time-restricted intermittent fasting or where one is doing um, where both groups are calorie-restricting and one's doing it within a, a time window and the other isn't, both groups get metabolic improvements. And the But the advantage of um, metabolically of time-restricting is actually smaller than the calorie restriction, but is much more sustainable. So there have been relatively few studies where you're not where you're not comparing against calorie restriction, and in a way, it was quite tough for restricted time eating to show an improvement when you'd already 
uh, cut the calories and the body was in a, a different state. So you've got the body in a starving state and, and then you're fiddling with the time windows. It's perhaps not surprising that, that you didn't get that much of a, sort of a significant improvement on top. And that's what a couple of studies have shown. So it's a bit complicated, but just to recap, um, yes, intermittent fasting works to improve your metabolic state. And that's by calorie restriction. But I don't believe that's for most people sustainable. And I think they will uh, regain, you know, those metabolic factors and their weight when they when they stop. Uh, time restricted eating is not as effective in quantitative terms in the metabolic health, but it does have some benefits, but is much more sustainable. And so that that's why I'm I'm interested in it. Now, whether either of these have longevity benefits, I think we it's too early to tell. But um, there's reasonable expectation that if you improve all your parameters like blood pressure and your blood sugar levels, blood fat levels, you know, that's going to help you um, live longer. I think for a lot of people, what brings them into wanting to eat better, eating cleaner is weight loss. And we know that if somebody gets into time restricted eating, they improve their metabolic health. Generally, if they have weight to lose, that's going to be a catalyst to help with that. But what other things within the food paradigm would you recommend to somebody if they're having trouble losing weight? I mean, some people are advised doing a, a couple of weeks of uh, calorie restricted intermittent fasting to kickstart the process. Um, and I don't think there's any empirical data on that. It's just rather anecdotal as a, as a way to do it. Um, that as long as it doesn't last too long, then. Um, it might, you might be able to do that. Now, many of these studies have shown that even without calorie restriction, you, um, some people do lose weight. Um, some people don't, some people do. And I think the first thing to do is to just say, well, you know, some people might be more susceptible, others not. And I think there's an individuality about that, but that's the first thing to do. The other thing is that, Time restricted eating, just by making you think about not eating outside your windows, generally does reduce your energy intakes slightly. Because if you think about it, you're not going to grab that cookie or that bit of cheese just before you go to bed because your brain says, okay, no, I, I need to have a decent fasting interval. You're not going to have that sugary drink, um, you know, out of hours, if you know what I mean. So I think it's quite a good discipline that means that, um, most people will be intaking less in a very gradual way that doesn't upset their body and stress it and doesn't cause any rebounds. So uh, I think that's that's true. But I think how you eat is only one part of the equation. And I think um, we know that you want to do other things to Im improve your weight that um, will also help. So what you eat is still of the primary importance here. And for me, the number one uh, thing is is to eat for your gut microbiome and have that as the core of say, well, if your gut microbes would like it, then generally it's good. Um, and you should avoid as much as possible ultra-processed foods because they're bad for your gut microbiome. And we know that calorie for calorie – the fact of processing means it's going to make you hungrier. It's going to uh, make you more tired. It's going to give you more sugar peaks, more inflammation, etc. And so in a way, if you simply combined time restricted eating with a policy to really reduce your uh, eating of ultra processed foods, uh, you know, most people will, will find they should be able to lose some weight gradually over that time. And I think it's important to not try and tell people to lose weight rapidly because I think that is a, you know, a diet is basically just setting yourself up for failure because your body is designed to bring you back um, to that baseline and probably overswing. So people who are interested in weight loss, I think it's, a, it's a re realizing this is a gradual, sustainable change over years you need to do. And uh, 
there isn't a quick fix that's going to work. It's about training your body to eat at different times, getting the, you know, your, your, your metabolism much more efficient. It's about realizing that you're eating foods that are good for your uh, microbes, which are producing the chemicals to keep your metabolism optimum and your immune system optimum. And it's about avoiding nasty chemicals through the ultra processed foods and that are triggering your brain to overeat and, and do other things. So it's, it, it's a sort of relearning of our nutri- nutrition really. And for me, it's about forgetting all that nonsense about calories and fats and even sugars. You know, I think we've just gone too reductionist on this and, um, need to take a much more holistic view of food and because you know you can talk all day about macronutrients and protein levels and whatever but in the end of the day you've got to replace something with something and uh, we have to eat something and drink something i love this idea of eating for the microbiome we did get into this in great detail last time we talked i'm sure we're going to get into it again at least somewhat here but one thing that comes to me as you're talking about that is carbohydrates so if we're going to eat for the microbiome we're going to want to eat a lot of different colored plants a lot of different plants which generally plant foods are higher in carbohydrates that's a general statement but when it comes to weight loss one of the things typically people do when they're trying to lose weight is cut down on carbs so interesting paradigm there where we're trying to A lot of people are going to probably try and cut down on carbohydrates to lose weight, but that's where a lot of the fiber and polyphenols are to feed the microbiome. So I'm curious how you think about all that. Yeah, it comes back to this idea of oversimplifying diets and uh, and regimes to sort things out. And I think, you know, we've got to this stage where nutrition is a bit like a religion. Are you in the, you know, the low... You're in the low fat diet group, you're in the low carb diet group. And, you know, within fats, there are hugely healthy fats that we should be having masses of, and there's some very unhealthy fats we should be avoiding. Similarly, in carbs, you know, there's ultra refined carbs that are starchy, stodgy ones, which are just like eating sugar. And there's super healthy carbs that provide all the polyphenols and the fiber for our bodies. And, you know, pretty dumb if we lump them all together and treat them as one. You know, we've got to start being much more discriminatory, understanding much more about about these and realize that, you know, it, it's not about three or four items. We're dealing with 30,000 different chemicals in, in the foods we eat every day. We're dealing with, you know, 50,000 circulating metabolites in our blood and and chemicals produced by our, our our microbes it's intensely complicated so i think it's much we need to think in much more holistic terms rather than trying to just say carbs versus um fats what do you do about it and this is the trap that people fall into yes uh, keto diets for example for the people that can support them do allow some people to lose weight quite rapidly. But if they maintain that and they're having really high fat levels of 70%, they really haven't got much room on their plate to keep their gut health adequate. And particularly if they have a sort of mental aversion to uh, carbs and plants, then they're going to be in real trouble because they'll be very soon have a very denuded diet that isn't going to be something that's going to sustain their long-term health. So that's the trade-off you, you've got to make. And that's, again, this danger of, of short-term dieting has a very different um, plan, I think, to to long-term maintenance of health. And I think that that's what I'm much more interested in is uh, trying to teach people that, you know, for your gut health, it doesn't matter if you want to – you know, I don't, there's no particular limit for me about fats in your diet, as long as you can get 30 plants a week into on your plate. Okay, by all means, put yogurts and uh, uh, meats on that. I don't mind. Um, lots of cheese, that's fine. Um, but you know, the key is you still got to have that diversity, and it's not about um, thinking that, that, you know, broccoli is the same as rice, you know, 
they're very different. Um, and it doesn't have to be huge amounts of it. And, um, realize that also nuts and seeds are, are something that can, can be high in fats, but also are, you know, typically plants that also have some of the, the beneficial properties. So I think it's all about sort of re-educating people in different ways to not think in quite sort of binary terms about food. Let's stick with that diversity piece and talk about the 30 different plants in a week, because I think this is a great goal for people. It's going to get them, hopefully, when they're doing their grocery shopping, you know, checking out different things and, and figuring out different recipes to include these. But why is the diversity so important? Let's take that right into the gut, getting these different plants to the microbiome. Why is that important? Okay, so the, the 30... The 30 plant rule came from a study that um, I did with Rob Knight's team in San Diego um, about five or six years ago, where we looked at 11,000 Brits and American guts and correlated the, the diversity and health of their gut microbiome with things in their diet. And what, what we turned out that the the number one factor that correlated with the best gut health was not whether they were vegan, it wasn't whether they were gluten-free, vegetarian, pescatarian, whatever. It was just the number of different plants they had over a week. And that's what really sort of changed our minds about this. This was a pretty good mantra for people to take that you could come at it from lots of different directions. It you know, didn't specify which type of plant they were. Uh, and people forget what plants are. Plants are not just your kale and broccoli but, and spinach, but they are also your the average seed, which is incredibly nutritious. It's a nut, uh, and different nuts count as different plants. It can be um, – I now think of coffee as a, as a plant – uh, I didn't before. This is, you know, my research into coffee, how amazingly good it is. And it's actually a source of fiber for, you know, a major source of fiber for most Americans, for example. Um, uh, dark chocolate can, is, you know, made from a bean that is a, a plant. Um, so if, if you take that more liberal view of plants, it's quite easy to get your, your 30 a week. And if you have to think of the, a plant is made up of, lots of different fibers and chemicals. And the key part is it's a whole plant. So it goes beyond your stomach and your small intestine and goes right down to the colon where uh, it can be met by your, your microbes and they start to digest it with their enzymes. They break it apart, they get the nutrients and they're stimulated by other things in the plants called polyphenols, which they use as energy. And in return, they produce all these healthy chemicals that are, are key for our metabolism, our immune system, regulating our brain, our mood, all kinds of other stuff. So it's that link of getting the right foods to the right place. And the reason they have to be different is that they're so highly specialized that you have a different set of microbes that's going to be attacking your um, purple carrot and your orange carrot because the chemicals in those two plants are different. And so it'd be a whole different team of microbes working on them. And if you give them different foods, you'll be able to grow up different microbes. That's the, the theory of what we're trying to do here and why it's important not to do, you know, the old English way of eating. Well, you know, a bit of meat and two veg was the, you know, and one of the veg was potatoes. It would either be carrots or peas. That's all, you know, that was the, uh, seen as a healthy meal, but now it's very much, um, uh, you know, it'd be meat and five veg uh, should be the new sort of mantra. And so if you try and get variety, you're not going to get too much of anything. So if you're, if you're every meal, you're thinking about getting that diversity in there. You don't tend to overeat on any of the starchy um, mm -hmm. carbs that people worry about, uh, you know, quite rightly, because if you just ate, mashed potato all the time or mm. uh, fluffy rice, you're getting huge sugar spikes. And for many people, not everybody, that, that can be unhealthy. But, you know, it doesn't mean you can't then have a small amount of rice as long as you've got lots of other 
plants on that plate as well. So just to make sure I have this right, you talked about how plants have these polyphenols. Diversity is important. Does science know yet why that diversity is so important? It's not just a fiber thing, getting a certain amount of fiber, whether it be soluble, insoluble. What I'm getting at here, do we understand the different chemicals in the different plants that highlights the importance of the diversity? Is it polyphenols or is it stuff that science hasn't discovered yet? Well, it's undoubtedly a bit of the latter, but it's certainly uh, a lot of it is polyphenols. But we still know very little about polyphenols. There are thousands of them, and many of them we don't know their functions. And or we, we can measure their total amounts, but we don't know all the individual ones that go on. And there's a huge variety of um, in polyphenol counts in foods, and this is one thing I uh, go into in the book in quite a long, in a lot of detail, is trying to work out within a range, say lettuces, salads, you can have a two thousand fold difference between the poly- amount of healthy polyphenols in that plant, um, so that uh, you'd have to eat a thousand times more iceberg lettuces, for example, than a nice. Uh, Lola Rosso, Italian uh, lettuce with those purple tips, because there's virtually no nutrients in an iceberg lettuce and those masses in that other one, which you can sort of look and see with your eyes, the, the pigment, and you can taste that slight peppery bitterness to that gives you the clues. So I think it's really interesting to try and link what we can do with our eyes and our mouth to... Um, you know, and we can choose foods and link that to the chemistry underneath. So that when you're having those two different foods, one, you're getting no polyphenols and very little fiber and just a dressing for the mayonnaise or whatever. Uh, but it does last, you know, three weeks at the bottom of your fridge. And the other one, which goes off and you've got all these defense chemicals and you've got the fiber and it's having a really major effect on your, on your body and producing, you know, keeping lots of microbes alive. So that's why I want people to learn more about food and get excited about the different types that we're seeing and not just be sort of spoon fed whatever, you know, um, food companies or hotels want to feed us, you know, the, the, which generally tends to be the stuff that never goes off, that has no taste, that has no polyphenols, that um, is rotten. Like the ubiquitous breakfast bar in the, in Canada and the US, the, um, the the green melon, you know. Um, it's, it's the most thrown away item, I think, in um, uh, in North America. And Honeydew? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, because, you know, they're bred for just lasting a long time, looking good, having no taste and virtually no nutrients. A few years ago, the big talk or one of the big talks in the health space was antioxidants. And I know antioxidants somehow tie into this polyphenol thing. Are they just, is polyphenol a type of antioxidant? Or are they just renaming antioxidants now to polyphenols? Or how, does, how do those fit together? Well, antioxidants was a general term for things that they knew were beneficial, but they didn't quite know how they worked. Um, and they sort of, there was this general theory that these were sort of nutritious chemicals that in somehow mopped up uh, dangerous um, excess chemicals in, in the cells and the reactions. And we now know that a large number of those antioxidants are actually polyphenols and they don't work directly on the body, they have to work via the gut microbes who then produce chemicals that then help the body. So we're we're slowly discovering that we didn't really know what antioxidants were. We just knew there were some generally healthy chemicals in foods and working out now more the mechanisms of how they work. So we're still sorting this out and there are still some, a few antioxidants that aren't polyphenols or don't come into that general category, but most of them um, I think are, are in these polyphenols or uh, group of phenolic compounds that uh, we're increasingly seeing. But it's it's slightly confusing um, as we make this transition. 
But I think most people, when they talked about antioxidant, didn't really understand what it meant. It, it is a vague scientific term. Um, and it, it sort of served a purpose for a while, but I think we can generally uh, ignore it now. Yeah, it was always very general. We want more antioxidants and yeah, they're going to help mop up free radicals in the body. That was the big thing. Yeah, and I think that that was also the time where we were talking about purging the body of toxins and uh, cleansing and all this mumbo jumbo that um, we now know is is complete nonsense that, you know, and actually it's just the repair process that happens every day in our in our cells. And so um, I think, yeah, we're, we're growing up slowly, but um, it's taken a while because, you know, we just haven't had the science behind it to, to really understand. And the, and the gut microbes are unlocking a lot of this science to tell us, um, you know, how they, they convert something in food to an active compound that can affect the body. Tim, I know last time we chatted, we got into polyphenols and how they end up reacting with the gut microbiome and what they do. But I want to make sure I'm really clear on this. Let's continue the story here. So polyphenols, we're getting, we want to get lots of them. We want to get them. There's a bunch of different ones. So we want a diverse array. What happens when they get down to the gut microbiome? You mentioned that the gut makes chemicals out of them. Is this postbiotics or what are these chemicals? Yes. Yeah, so they they act as energy for the gut microbes. So particular gut microbes will be sent, they can smell out the different types of plant you're eating. They'll zoom in on it and they'll start burrowing away in order to get the little nuggets of polyphenols that they can then use for energy and then replicate and get, you know, uh, have more babies and grow their colony. And then in turn produce their own chemicals and the chemicals that microbes produce, as you rightly said, are postbiotics. And these postbiotic chemicals, which is a sort of new term, but it's a bit like um, probiotics, but made by the microbes. And we know that they actually make a large number of things that we thought were only made by the liver. So they can replicate a lot of things that the human body makes, but also make a lot of products that humans can't make. And what's called a postbiotic is when we believe it has some health benefit because we haven't classified every every chemical they make because a lot of them are just to help each other, help themselves or communicate directly with the immune system or the nervous system or the brain or whatever. But ones that seem to have a direct health benefit are these postbiotics. And so this is a whole new area of therapy because um, people are thinking about growing up vast vats of bacteria that can produce these really healthy chemicals as a new form of supplementation, for example, without having to eat the food and have the gut microbes. So there's an enormous amount of interest that these these are sort of naturally occurring chemicals in our, in our body must be safe by definition because they're in us and how do we make more of them? Let's talk about short chain fatty acids and how they fit into this whole big picture. So they're one of the classical postbiotics and they are made when um, particular microbes uh, are fermenting plants so you can't get them from they don't actually come from fats interestingly so they um, they come from when you when a microbe uh, is is having some fiber rich foods it's a fiber digesting microbe and it picks up whatever energy it needs from the polyphenols of that plant, and then it will produce these short-chain fatty acids. And the commonest one of those is butyrate, and it's believed to be a really beneficial postbiotic that uh, has benefits on, particularly on our immune cells and regulating the immune system and dampens down inflammation and is, is generally healthy. Um, what's interesting is that when... They've given butyrate in clinical trials to people. You, don't, you get rather sporadic results. So it shows that it's not as easy just to transfer what the microbes do in a natural environment. And you can't suddenly make it into a pill and, it, and it's um, a game changer. So and it, it could be because there's a ratio of uh, that particular product to compared to other ones, other short chain fatty acids that's important or it. It could be other things we still don't, we're still ignorant about. But that's 
one of the big things about why we believe that eating fiber is important, nothing to do with, uh, you know, cleansing our, our digestive tract or repairing or, you know, having fast transit times. It's the fact that this allows all these short chain fatty acids to be produced, which we know that is health, generally healthy. People who have high levels of, of these short chain fatty acids naturally are much healthier and tend to be thinner and have less diseases. So it's increasingly being used as a marker of good health. And do we specifically know what the short chain fatty acids are doing in the body, where they're going and, and why they're so important? We know a little bit, um, but we, we certainly don't have the full picture. We maybe know 10% of what's going on with them. You know, they are quite hard to measure and it's, it's hard to trace them entirely. And that's why most of the work has been going on on their interactions with uh, T cells in the lining of the, of the gut, the immune cells. So they're really important in um, suppressing food allergies and things like that, or the immune cells overreacting. They may have a role in um, aging and repair. Um, lots of, there's lots of potential reasons, but it, it seems to be a tight control of, of the immune system. And so it doesn't overreact, doesn't underreact. Uh, but it does fight infection, etc., cetera, and, and it is useful for repair and picking up early cancers and these things. So it's it, it probably has a widespread role all across the body rather than one specific one that we can home in on. And that's maybe why just giving people vast doses of butyrate, which I think, um, you know, it has is has a very, it was used in stink bombs and various other things and uh, uh, it, it's produced in, rotting fish and things in large amounts. So it, it's a strange compound to think of as a super healthy. But uh, Talk more about that connection between the immune system and the gut. We know a big part of the immune system is down there surrounding, you know, our gut. And it's it's very well integrated with the microbiome down there. So we know building up our, we've been talking about, you know, building up a healthy gut microbiome, how important this is. But let's go deeper into why from an immune standpoint, this is so important. Most of our immune cells are actually in the lining of our gut. So no one really understood why that was for a long time. Uh, people thought it was just a defensive barrier to combat what was going on. But increasingly, it, it seems to be that it's for communication rather than as a defense. So all, all the way along the gut, the immune cells are receiving nutrients from the gut. So that's as food is being digested, um, bits of it are going to, to feed the, the immune cells on the, on the gut wall. But they're also getting these chemical signals from the microbes, telling them um, about the food that's being eaten and stimulating them to, as I said, to react or underreact, you know, as a way of uh, making sure that the the immune immune system is is, is working well, it, it it may be also to do with whether it's feeding time or fasting time, about whether it can relax because our you know we have a circadian rhythms um, for this and it's not just about daylight. The the gut is a really important driver of whether our body's in sort of action mode or it's in rest mode. And so all these signals are being passed to the immune cells, and then they then uh, pass this on through the body or you know, to the rest of the body to say, let's rest and repair, or you know, let's get ready to fight, guys, um, and not to overreact or underreact. And so that's why many people think that because the deterioration in our diet in the last 30 years We've, you know, got the wrong signals from our gut microbes that's upset our immune cells. And we have this uh, epidemics of food allergies, for example, that uh, just didn't exist uh, 40 years ago uh, because the immune cells are overreacting because they're just not getting the right signals uh, to calm them down from, from the gut. Uh, so many other potential things that have changed uh depending on where you see that you know if you see 
that our gut microbes have changed dram- so dramatically in the last hundred years compared to the last few million, it sort of makes sense. Whereas our immune cells probably haven't. Tim, I know you're a big fan. We've talked about the diversity. We want to get at least 30 different plants in per week to keep our microbiome healthy. I know you're not a big fan of labeling certain foods as superfoods, but are there certain heavy hitters when it comes to these polyphenols, fiber, certain foods people might want to consider as part of that 30 on a regular basis that are especially good for the gut? Yeah, I mean, the book goes into this in a fair bit of detail. There are tables outlining what the best ones are. Um, You know, your best bang for your buck is to combine fiber and polyphenols together, right? So you, you sort of covering your bases. And so, you know, I've, lo- I've listed coffee as an unlikely one, right? We, most people wouldn't call that a superfood, but it, it does increasingly looking like one. Then you've got a whole range of berries and, um, the humble blueberry, which, you know, is ubiquitous does pretty well. It, you don't have to get some uh, Peruvian superberry uh, just to be good. You know, something like a blueberry, a blackberry, a raspberry, um, all of these can, are good. You freeze them when, when they're in season and they are perfectly good in terms of the polyphenol and fiber count when you defrost them. So there are a few easy tips that you can use year round, you know, for breakfast or on your salads or whatever. We have nuts and seeds, which are inexpensive and hugely good in terms of uh, fiber and um, polyphenol counts. And you can get a lot of variety by, by using different ones. And I always keep a big jar of mixed seeds and nuts uh, in my kitchen that I'm always replenish when I find something, some new nut or seed, I just put it in. Um, and again, you don't have to go for the expensive superfood, you know, trendy uh seed of the of the of the month um it's the variety that's really important there um and i think i think what i discovered actually I, there's much more to mushrooms than uh meets the eye i think i've been really underestimating mushrooms and i think mushrooms are, are a pretty good superfood that um they're really high in protein content they're really high in fiber and they're more like animals than plants interestingly uh, when you look at them genetically. And there are hundreds of different edible uh, varieties that will give you, you know, give your gut microbe biome a, a, bit, a rich variety. So I think their suits also become, when you ferment them, they become really good meat alternatives um, of the future. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more about mushrooms. And interestingly, of all, of all the plants I saw that, you know, had amazing claims for them. Um, I think it was mushrooms that came out top in terms of helping chemotherapy in cancer and uh, in lowering blood pressure, etc. Really um, convincing studies. So um, I think my message is that don't get fooled by the advertising and go for the most expensive, um, exotic, you know, uh, tropical seed or, or berry or plant many of them you know under our noses and uh we need to we need to use it and just you know have a look and see if there's any data on the fiber uh if you can get something on the polyphenol counts um you know but uh, you can't go far wrong if you you know berries nuts and seeds and, uh, and mushrooms would be the top of my list but you know there are plenty of others and of course you know what i what I want people to do is to go out there and be adventurous and find different ones every week. Right? Um, don't get stuck on the same berry. That's a, a route to isolation. How do you feel about the medicinal mushrooms, things like chaga, reishi? And these aren't mushrooms that we cook up and consume, but we would use them through tinctures or making teas. Are you a fan? I wasn't convinced that there's hard evidence to support them. I mean, Unless you're into the psychedelic mushrooms, where there's definitely a effect that um, the psilocybin producing mushrooms definitely have effects. And there are now proper trials showing that they can actually cure depression, anxiety, and uh, potentially schizophrenia. But you shouldn't take them without 
you know, um, uh, supervision and in a very controlled environment. But for the other ones, I, it was all anecdote, really. Uh, I, I couldn't find hard evidence to support them. But, you know, I, I'm a big fan of all mushrooms anyway. So, um, but what was interesting is you often get more nutrients out of them when you have them, uh, slightly cooked than you do having them raw. So there obviously will be exceptions to certain chemicals that come out. So just steeping them in tea, um, might give you very different chemicals that, than if you just fry them in oil or, uh, steam them. But I think we're in the, you know, we're in the real learning stages here and we should all eat much more mushrooms. So however you consume them, uh, I think it's a good thing, but yeah, I'm paying ridiculous prices for some of them. Um, I, I think that's, that's more marketing and, uh, you know, just because a mushroom is given a fancy name, um, you know, rather than its Latin name, um, I'm not sure I'd, I'd pay an extra 20 bucks for one of the areas of the book that I really enjoyed is when you got into extra virgin olive oil and you went deep into that subject and, and covered quite a bit. So let's talk about why this is such a quote unquote superfood. And some of the, the area that I found really interesting within that is how we really need to go to the source and figure out quality because there are these companies out there that are, you know, for lack of a better word, watering down their oils. Yeah, uh, olive oil is a, a, a good one because culturally, you know, the UK and US Canada hasn't used olive oils. It was only in pharmacies and things, you know, to wash your ears out uh, when I was a kid. And it's, it's only the last 20 years or so that it have become mainstream. And yeah, they are now produced in California and other places like this. But um, realizing that, you know, there's different grades and there's a huge difference in the, the, the quality for your health just by picking the higher grade ones rather than come the ones that have a flashy label, but actually it only says virgin olive oil and just missing that little word extra. And that difference make a hundredfold difference to the polyphenol counts just by changing the acidity of the oil and the purity of it. And so that's one thing to look out for. And even when you get to the extra virgin olive oils, which I think is you know, one of the healthiest parts of your diet and one of the keys to the Mediterranean diet is the fact that they use so much of this stuff, which has fats, which in the old days we used to say was bad for you. Now we're quite happy to say is good for you. Um, but a lot of those is not just the fats, but it's, it's these, the polyphenols that give it that bitter taste. And you know, a good olive oil when you, it just makes you cough. If you ever have it raw or something, you, you know, you're tasting it in a bit of bread in the fancy restaurant. If it, that pepperiness, that cough, that shows that is absolutely full of those polyphenols that are good for you. And what I found is investigations show a lot of fraud, uh, in, in the olive oil markets. Um, and so you should always buy your olive oil from somewhere you trust, uh, where it comes from a single, uh, place, not a mixture of oils and where you know the country of origin uh, because otherwise it's really hard to trace this stuff and it they could have added in all kinds of uh, impurities um, and each country is going to depend have different rules on on how it surveils it but increasingly around the world it's really hard to keep um, f you know food secure so get your get your sources know what it tastes like you know and um pay a little bit extra for it, it'd be well worth it. You mentioned the importance there, having that extra word extra in front of virgin olive oil. How does that differ when it comes to processing versus not having that? Well, it's it's a bit like the, um, it's the, the level of processing. It, 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 it goes from being a sort of relatively unprocessed product to a highly processed product where they're, um, they not only using mechanics, which is what the extra virgin, what they just, you know, the old, pretty much the same way as they've done it for hundreds of years. You just uh, squash it and, and the juice comes out and you get rid of the, um, the, the, the olive skin. Uh, but they start to use chemicals and uh, wash it away, and it cha the pH changes, so they sort of have to change the acidity to to extract it. So they're extracting the 
the hard to get stuff, sort of residue from the, um, from the high quality ones. And that's, that's what they use. And that's even slightly better than the next grade down, which is just, um, uh, olive oil, which, uh, is really the scrapings of all the rubbish, uh, that you get in, in any form. So it's, you know, bits of the stone, bits of it, you know, and they can add all kinds of other stuff to it. So, um, but you can simply taste the difference, you know, if you put the, th- the three of them together, uh, completely different. But most people don't know that because, you know, there isn't a tra- tradition of, of oil. But in Italy, no one would buy their olive oil from a supermarket. They say only tourists do that. They buy it from someone they know and they go to and they, you know, they trust because they know even in Italy, there's a lot of uh, fraud and sticking labels on uh, Greek olive oil and calling it, you know, um, Italian and uh, Spanish and Moroccan and, you know, whatever. So lots of trickery around. And you're a fan of cooking with olive oil, which is different than the common opinion in the health and wellness space. So talk about why this is, because a lot of people say it goes rancid or it goes beyond the smoke point when we cook with it. Yeah, so... When I started uh, researching this, that was very much the mainstream view is that said, well, yeah, olive oil is good for salads, but, you know, don't use it on cooking because uh, you get this blue black smoke when you cook with it and you get these carcinogens coming off. And this was very much the common view of, particularly in America, I must say, uh, U- uh, US chefs said, okay, you've got to use high smoke point peanut oil, you know, to, do anything in, in high cooking. And this became sort of ingrained in the, uh, in the mines. And so I started looking at it and also spoke to some fat experts. And it transpires that yes, these, the smoke points of olive oil are, uh, you know, around 204 degrees to 208 degrees, but you rarely, uh, get to that point in normal cooking. So, if you're frying something normally, it's 160, 180 uh, degrees in a pan. And so this, the idea that you're going to get all this carcinogen smoke is actually nonsense. Unless you're doing really, uh, wok, wok frying at high intensity heats. So that for a start isn't, a, isn't a problem. And say anything above 200 is fine. And I also found that, um, they were saying, you know, it it does go rancid, but you shouldn't keep olive oil for, you know, more than a year, most probably more than six months, and you should keep it out of the light and you know pay attention to it. It's a it's a living product, uh, a bit like wine, it does go off. But um, what the other the other side of the coin is that because it has a lot of saturated fat, it's actually more stable compared to. So these other ones, more vegetable oils that are mixed fats or with polyunsaturates that actually when you, uh, you fry with them a lot, particularly if you reuse them, they get very unstable and then they can produce lots of different chemicals that some of those might would be bad. So really, I think we'd gone, I don't know who started these rumors, but they were really false. And in the Mediterranean countries that have the best heart reduced heart disease they have best longevity they only use one oil and that is extra virgin olive oil in everything and they're a lot healthier and people who tell me you should use coconut oil or peanut oil well i don't want my all my foods tasting like coconuts and peanuts you know and and uh, i much prefer that uh, olive oil taste so yeah that that's my go-to um oil and I think it's going to be the best for your health. We know you're a big fan of the olive oil. What other oils would we find in your kitchen? I do have some um, high quality rapeseed oil. Um, so you can get some uh, ones, you know, that are not, that are not ultra processed ones that uh, are actually high grade. And I use those when I don't want to get too much uh, of an olive oil taste if you've got a very re- refined dish or if I, if I'm doing, it has a slightly higher smoke point. So you might want to take it up, take it up higher. Avocado oil I have, but it's very expensive. 
Um, and so I tend not, not to use that that much. But, um, uh, and of course, occasionally, you know, we'll still use the occasional bit of butter if you really want to have an old fashioned, um, French dish that's, uh, a bit of an indulgence, which I can't justify on health grounds, but, um, I occasionally taste better, but I wouldn't do that regularly. Tim, a little side pivot from the food thing. We focus a lot on the microbiome here and, and how to build a healthy microbiome. But what are some of the things in our environment that people are commonly using or doing that are destroying that microbiome? Um, well, the first thing is most people are taking antibiotics. Very hard to avoid antibiotics, but and we certainly do need them. Usually at some point in our life, there'll be a point where we we were glad we took antibiotics, may have saved our life or stopped a, a major infection. But we probably overuse them about three ty- threefold. So, um, you know, often treat viruses with antibiotics, which are completely ineffectual and just uh, damage your gut microbes. So just questioning whether you need to antibiotics or you should wait a bit longer, I think is, is important. Um, there's obviously... S- um, ultra processed foods is the other probably big source of damage to your gut microbiome. Not only do they rarely have any fiber in them, because most of the food you have out in that's ultra processed is absorbed early up in the gut and gets into the bloodstream very fast. None of the fiber gets to the lower, the colon and the microbes. So they're sort of effectively being starved. And then there's lots of other chemicals in ultra processed foods and drinks that we now know disrupt the gut microbes, such as artificial sweeteners, um, emulsifiers, gums, uh, certain preservatives, etc. So that's that whole other category of foods that um, we don't know precisely how they affect the gut microbes, but we know they give them they have, they give off abnormal signals uh, when you test people giving those specific ones and it could be that some people there's an individuality to it so there's some new data showing that some people particularly uh, will respond badly to certain emulsifiers um, like carrageenan for example uh, and certain people but not others might uh, respond badly to saccharin and and sucralose Uh, so they have a metabolic reaction to these things as well as a, a gut microbiome reaction um, and the, I guess the third category um, is through uh, the use of herbicides and pesticides. And this is a, a new area that hasn't really been studied. There's not aren't large scale studies. They're very expensive to do. And uh, as you can imagine, the industry isn't very keen to uh, highlight it. Uh, we're so dependent on things like glyphosate and Roundup. But what I did find is, you know, that there's huge differences in if, if you're a big strawberry lover uh, or you like your oat porridge, you know, you, you're going to be eating five times more uh, herbicides than anyone else because there's five times more in those in those foods than the other, other foods you eat. So it pays to know where these things are coming from. And there's increasing evidence that these um, herbicides – don't attack human cells or genes at all because they've you know, been well studied for that, but they do affect your gut microbes that aren't protected and they change and then they, your, your community will then produce abnormal chemicals as a result. And it's still theoretical where well, there's no hard proof of this, but it could be one reason that, um, there are these, uh, examples of people with high exposures getting um, certain rare cancers, etc. So, you know, we don't know the full story yet, but certainly there's room for concern if you're a vegetarian eating lots of plants that are sprayed regularly with herbicides and pesticides, or you um, uh, are, you know, pregnant or, you know, you've got young children eating a lot of these things, particularly uh, lots of oats and um, berries, etc., that do get uh, sprayed this way. So I think... These are all, these are, you know, they're some of the common things that um, people often don't think about that uh, can affect the gut market that aren't, aren't related directly to food. Uh, but, you know, also 
um, living just in a city is, you know, will impair your gut microbiome compared to it being in the country. So, How so? Well, we don't really know, but it, just being close to nature, soil, all the microbes in animals, um, plants, um, I think cities are more sterile places. And so generally people who live in the countryside do have more diverse gut microbes than, than people in cities. And you should always get a smelly dog and um, you know, kiss a smelly dog if you want to improve your, your gut microbes. Coming back to that herbicide pesticide piece, Tim, are you somebody that when you can, you buy organic? Yes, I'm not obsessional about it, but my regular um, fruits and vegetables, I do get organic. Because I've realized that in the last so 10 years, as I've gone more plant-based, certainly I'm actually exposing myself more, ironically, to uh, these chemicals than I was uh, perhaps when I was eating more meats and, and uh, just potatoes and things. So um, yes, I, I try and do that. And I now, you know, We'll, we'll wash them off um, more than I used to. And um, luckily I've given up things like oats, but, um, you know, that would have been a worry if I was on a, a regular oat breakfast. Uh, and breakfast cereals have a lot of these. these in, And they tend to be higher levels also in, in, in North America than in Europe. Uh, the levels permitted are, are greater. So it's perhaps another reason that, you know, we should be switching to more organic uh, plant and the more people do it, the prices will then come down. So it's a sort of um, uh, catch twenty two. In pesticides aside, have you looked at any of the research that looks at, from a nutritional perspective, the difference of food that's organic versus conventional? Yeah, I mean, there there's some evidence that um, there's you know more omega three in uh, organic meat, beef, than uh, non-organic. There's some evidence that there are higher polyphenol counts in um, non-pesticide-treated plants, which sort of makes sense in a way, because they have to defend themselves. Therefore, they're tougher. Uh, and so if you just spraying them all the time, they get a bit lazy and said, oh, who needs who needs defense chemicals when I've got, you know... Um, all that Roundup sprayed on me, you know, and the soil is completely sterile, you know. So there's that. And then there's been some epidemiology studies showing that in France, people who had regular organic foods did have uh, less heart disease and cancers, although it's an observational study, so it's not uh, by, f by far definitive. But I think the evidence is, is building that really wasn't there a few years ago. So we are getting more and more evidence to support that uh, it, it is worthwhile. I'm glad you highlighted, Tim, there, the fact that these polyphenols are actually part of the defense mechanism of plants. And when they, you know, have a harsher life, those are actually going to accumulate more within the plant. Yes, and I think we're going to be hearing more of this sort of stuff as, as polyphenols start to get highlighted, as this becomes more general knowledge, because the food manufacturers can now manipulate uh, some foods and plants to produce more polyphenols. And I was speaking to um, uh, some uh, food producer who makes um, uh, organic foods in rather artificial scenarios, and they've worked out that just by putting a lot of wind into one of these uh, tunnels, they get like 30% more polyphenol growth in those plants because uh, they feel that they, they need more uh, defenses. So I think in the future, we're going to be, we can actually manipulate some of these foods to uh, be healthier for us and move away from the, the iceberg lettuce, which clearly didn't have any foes at all, didn't need any polyphenols to ones that are really, you know, ready for a fight. And they're the, they're the ones. And it sort of explains it as well why, there's more polyphenols at the tips of plants and on the outside leaves of plants and in the sprouts. All these places that, you know, there's a lot of growth, and but it's a lot of danger. That's uh, that's where all the good stuff is. And in a way, we've 
probably gone the other way. We always get rid of that stuff and uh, go for the boring bits in the middle. You know, so uh, need to change our whole mindset. But it's it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, that is, and it's interesting to think of, you know, this this coevolution of plants and humans, and basically we're taking their defense mechanism and using that synergistically with our own biology to make ourselves healthier. It's just fascinating to think of it that way. Yeah, it is, and of course, you know, plants were around before humans. Um, they've been interacting with other animals, but of course, plants are interacting all the time with. Uh, microbes in the soil and that's how they've evolved as sort of, sort of co-evolved systems where they're swapping nutrients and chemicals with those microbes in the soil so we've come to the party late really um, but we're just finding out but it just sort of shows that once you start to mess with the soil with uh, all these fertilizers and uh, herbicides and pesticides you, you disrupt this normal uh, link between uh, you know, the plants and the microbes that have been around for, mi for millions of years. I know you're not a fan of different diet labels, whether it be vegan, keto, carnivore, which is what I want to get into now because it counters a lot of what we've been talking about today. So carnivore diets going to essentially have no fiber to feed the gut microbiome. So I'm curious because there is this momentum Within that paradigm, at least in the online space, people talking about how it's been a diet that's helped them, at least in the short term, improve their health. How do you think about that? Well, I can see why it helps people short term. Um, often it means they are eating whole foods, cutting out junk foods, cutting out a lot of these chemicals and things that are, that are uh, harmful to them, uh, reduces some of their appetite cravings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a sort of reductionist diet that's cutting out a lot of junk food but um where it might be a, a good way to get started you know have a, a clean break it is in my view absolutely for 99 percent of people not sustainable and not good long term for their health because it it will rapidly diminish the the quality of the gut microbiome and it can be very difficult to recover from it. So I think it's uh, it's mis misguided as a long-term um, way of life. I think it's fine as a short-term fix, you know, just like keto diets. Um, but I don't think they're sus easily sustainable, both from a for most people from a um, practicality point of view, but also um, as a long-term health point of view. And I think, you know, what I'd like is, yes, I'm quite happy for people to eat meat as long as they can still get a diversity of plants. And I think there ought to be ways of, um, you know, being more flexible within these diets to say, okay, I still like to have my meat. I'm not, I'm not going to have starchy vegetables. Okay. So you cut out your potatoes, your rice, your pasta. That's fine. But I'm going to have still get my, variety of plants to keep my gut microbes happy and you know try that but, you know don't be so rigid that you're gonna you know let dogma uh mess up your immune system and your your gut health um you know i'm not saying there aren't some people on the planet that don't do well on this you know we know that um you know eskimos and maasai and whatever can live you know have genetically evolved to live on very different diets can do so but I think for the majority of us, that's going to be pretty tough. Well, that's a big part of your message as a whole. The fact that we are all different and we need to look at what's going to work for us in our biology, which might not work for our neighbor. Yeah, that's why I'd, you know, I'm not dismissing everybody. You know, There aren't some people in the world that can't do very well on a predominantly meat diet or, you know, why it doesn't find there are billions of people who are, you know, total vegans. Um, we are omnivores. We're flexible. You know, we've evolved to live in different parts of the, of, of the world. But I think to optimize our health, most of us need to think of this extra organ in our body, which is the gut microbiome. And, and if it's a bit like saying, well, I don't mind eating, but I'm, I, you know, I'm not interested in my liver or my heart. You know, they can do what they like. You know, um, you do need them. And so uh, we need to think the same about our, our microbes. 
Up until this point, Tim, we've talked about the gut microbiome, but as somebody that is so fascinated by that and does research in this area, how do you think about the microbiome of our skin? Is that something you consider? Yes. Well, my wife's a dermatologist, so we often discuss uh, skin microbiome and it, it is very important. It, they, they, interestingly, we did a study on the genetics of body odor in our twins and I researched body odor. And it turns out that it's all the composition of the microbes on the skin that produce different chemicals that produce our unique body odors. So, um, they are important for our individuality. And again, in our skin, we are all very different. So that's why we all do smell different. That's why babies can always smell their mother. That's why all animals have this unique um, ability to separate humans. It's our individuality. And that's why a lot of skin diseases occur in some people, not others, um, is because, partly because of our different skin microbiome. And you know, in some ways it protects us and the others it, it can be a, a problem. And a lot of eczema and skin uh, dermatitis is, is caused, is related to the skin microbiome. And often overwashing and overusing soap and over hygiene has been a major problem, particularly in kids, in, in mothers overdoing it and making the whole problem worse. Often the microbiome is there to protect you and protect against disease. And overwashing has been a major cause of problems in, in recent years in the West. Well, this kind of ties back with what you just said. Plus, before when we talked about things in the environment that could affect the microbiome of the gut, this applies to both that and the skin. Are you somebody who's an advocate for using more natural products when it comes to cleaning the home, cleaning the skin? Do you think there's any validity in these? Yeah, I mean, my, my wife for example, says no one should ever use soap on their face. Um, and yet, uh, you know, um, the amount of products uh, many people use on their face to cleanse their face, which are highly artificial, is enormous. Putting chemicals on there, blocking the pores, getting rid of all those healthy microbes, um, massively overdoing it. And so, and also... Most women use um, skin creams that contain UPFs that protect against sunshine, and they use them all year round. So the skin and the microbes are not getting um, sunshine. They're not getting vitamin D. Uh, you know, I think we've, we've gone far too far the wrong way, and we need to get back to much more natural methods, certainly. But, so that's... That's the extent of my knowledge. It's rather broad brush, but I think it's it, it does it does resonate in, in that there there are definite parallels between how we treat our microbes in different parts of our body, and, and they are everywhere as well. And the same goes for you know um, there's lots of studies about vaginal microbes and uh, people over over hygiene air there that causes all kinds of problems and can cause infertility and things. So. Sometimes we just need to leave things naturally. And I'd have to assume too, using a lot of these chemical products to clean, you know, our bathrooms, our homes, they would have to impact the gut microbiome too, and not just the skin. Yeah, I don't think there's much data on that, but it's pretty obvious that if you're using bleaches and Dettols and things like this, that um, they're going to be harmful. This, there is some data of people who regularly use mouthwashes, chemical mouthwashes, have a uh, much poorer quality pro-inflammatory gut microbe, uh, oral microbes, and uh, ultimately cause more problems of bad breath and things than people who don't use them. So again, you get a short-term benefit, you cleanse, you get rid of all your gut microbes, you know, your breath might feel better for a couple of hours, but long-term, actually, you're doing them great damage. Tim, the new book, Food for Life. I really enjoyed it. We're going to link that up in the show notes. We're going to link up your social media, your website. I really enjoyed round two. Thank you so much. Been a pleasure. Now that you're done my conversation with Tim, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my previous chat with him where we go even deeper into food and the microbiome. There's a lot more to learn. I'll see you over there. So it does mean a little bit of education about our bodies and, you know, this new organ that's suddenly come into our lives which we